Okay, hello and welcome to episode 101 of the Market Maker podcast. And given it is this episode, I'm going to press the reset button, Piers, and I'm going to take us back to pretending this is our first episode. And if you can remember all the way back then, we used to have a pretty firm line that an episode should last only 20 minutes. And I realized as we completed episode 100, we drifted north of... 60 minutes so I just want to rein us in a little bit because I'm conscious of um you know okay even me trying to listen to you for an hour is is no one no one wants that (laughs) literally no one right so you know I'm not I'm not going to say we're going to commit to 20 but I'm going to commit to 30 and see how we go so let's um let's keep it concentrated on one key story and something that's definitely been um, very present in global media, and that is the Adani Group's $100 billion loss. You hear that and you kind of think, wow, that's a big loss. But then I did see Google shares are down well over that in the last <laughs> few days after their AI, I think it's Bard, their version of their chat GPT demonstration went a little bit array and then, or awry, and then their share price tanked pretty much, which is quite phenomenal to think about it. Um, the share price yeah. actually on that day dropped just shy of 8%. And yeah. that was more than when they missed their earnings estimates the, the week before. That makes sense, though. Hmm. You know, earnings, I mean, earnings, that's quarter by quarter, right? The AI race will define the next decade plus. So, yeah, I've got, there's nothing worse than doing a demo, like especially <laughs> like a tech demo where you're like, check this out. And then, oh. Uh, hang on a minute. That, yeah. Hang on. What? Well, um, yeah. That's, says no. <laughs> that's. I mean, that's bad. I mean, it shows you how. Well, I guess how Microsoft have. Well, I should say, um, OpenAI have kind of forced their hand, um, and really forced them to kind of reveal what they've got. Where are they in this mm. race? And yeah. Yeah. I, I, I. If I was. Alphabet and not just Microsoft with all the other tech companies, I would definitely partake in corporate espionage. <laughs> and I would definitely have inside moles who are feeding back to me all the time. Like, how can a company like Alphabet get blindsided? I know they've had the AI for a long time. And I know they've tried to coin this whole like, yeah, because we want to make sure it's it's for the right reasons and it does the right yeah. type of genuine result. It's like, no, no. They've caught you pretty blindsided on the timing of this, evidently. So, how does that happen? Like, well, uh, I a think lot of employees involved in this stuff, right? Well, we touched on this the other day, didn't we? When all these job cuts and like stripping out of middle management, and mm. they've just become bloated, and they've got so many projects, right? Because they've got so much cash. Yeah, let's just just have about a million different kind of tangential projects, and then you lose. I guess you just lose focus on the on pri- prioritizing, mm. um, and then and then yeah. this happens. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, look. Let, <laughs> let, be let's, let's um let's get on to Danny and what this story is, and we're going to incorporate a few different mm-hmm. things for a lot of people. Like, who is this guy? Um, how important is he? I mean, very recognizable domestically, but perhaps not yeah. so much on a global level. Yeah, um, Hindenburg, and we can talk a little bit there about who are they, what do they do, and what is activist short selling. We've talked about activists before. We've yeah. talked, I think, about short selling before, but let's combine the two, and and then we'll go through what's actually happened, the allegations, the fallout, the stock price bond yield reactions, and obviously uh, intertwined into this in, in Indian politics as well. So perhaps we could start with. Who is Adani? <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, but I, I mean, most people listening to this w- wouldn't have heard of him, mm. you know, until the the headlines over the last couple of weeks or whatever. But if you're Indian, then you'll definitely have heard of him. This guy, I mean, Guatan Guatam Adani. Yeah, he's kind of the self proclaimed Rockefeller of India. Basically, he's got a a sprawling empire, a sprawling kind of industrial conglomerate. Um, He's got, he owns India's biggest ports. 
He store his companies store about a third of its grain. He operates a fifth of its power transmission lines. He makes a fifth of the whole country's cement. Uh, he's among India's top 10 biggest non-financial firms by assets. Um, basically, he touches hundreds of millions of Indians' lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, the good, good act extracts I saw from Bloomberg to put that into context. They said that coal extracted from mines Adani owns is shipped via his ports and railroads, then hauled to the furnaces in his power plants. <laughs> Electricity produced runs on his transmission lines into homes built with his cement company, <laughs> where people prepare dinner on stoves fueled by Adani gas yeah. with Adani cooking oil, grains <laughs> and apples. And then later at their kitchen tables, they might discuss impending um, vacations, but of course, they're going to use flights from his airports, or yep. they might even scroll through photos stored in his data centers. <laughs> so yeah. basically, he's everywhere. He, he is <laughs> Mr. Your seeing eye. <laughs> Mr. India. Um, and maybe we'll get onto politics, but it, Modi, the Indian prime minister, is very much in his pocket. I mean, well, actually, when Modi won the election, uh, first time round, I think back, what was it, 2015, I think, um, he took a flight back to his sort of hometown to celebrate in Adani's private jet. And anyway, we'll get maybe get onto the politics. But look, yeah, this guy, you get, you get the story, right? Massive, massive industrialist um, and was, was past tense, the world's third richest man. Hmm. Uh, no longer. I mean, don't get me wrong. He's still, still disgustingly <laughs> rich, uh, but just not quite as disgustingly. Um, yeah, he's lost about half of his wealth in a couple of weeks. Painful. So what's going on here? Well, there's this guy, well, not guy, there's a, there's a firm called Hindenburg Research. Um, so they're a New York-based activist short seller. Okay. Um, so maybe let's just stop and describe what that is first before we talk about exactly what they've done here and how this little, tiny little sort of hedge fund firm in New York has somehow triggered a $114 billion sell-off in Adani uh, corporate value uh, just by issuing one report. So what this company does, they've they actually only been around um, since 2017. And over the past two years, they've published 19 investigations. And they what they do is they, they, they investigate companies to try and unearth wrongdoings, dodgy shenanigans, you know, governance issues, um, accounting fraud. Uh, stock manipulation, insider dealing, right? They're trying to, you know, deep dive and investigate and unroot. Uh, it's a bit like investigative journalism, I guess, in a way, right? And but but what they do is then they, if they find examples of where where they think dodgy stuff is happening, they then issue a report on their website. Prior to issuing the report, which is then a, the report is a damning report with all the evidence that they've uncovered before they make this report public on their website, they seek to profit from issuing their own report by short selling the stock or whatever financial assets like bonds, for example, that are related to this business. Um, so they're very much in the business of profiting from share prices, bond prices dropping. Um, and they try to force these asset prices to drop by releasing this damning report on their website. So how, how on earth does that fit regulatory requirements? I do want to get onto this because, you know, ultimately, obviously, well, not obviously, Adani has come out fighting mm. big time here to say all of this is nonsense. I mean, to hit, so Hindenburg's report was 100 pages long. Yeah. Right. That they issued on their website. It, there were 88. Uh, am I right in saying that? I think there were 88 um, points, 88 um, pieces of 
evidence to show that this company is being run fraudulently. Um, Adani, his rebuttal was a 413 page um, report that they issued explaining why every single one of these 88 allegations are false and then going way over the top by saying, who the hell is this Hindenburg lot? They're the dodgy ones. They're the ones that, you know, aren't um, well, like, actually, let me let me quote in the summary of this what 413 page report. And, and no, I did not read all of it, um, but it kicks off by <laughs> by describing Hindenburg as the made off of Manhattan. Uh, and then he's talking about the truth of the matter is Hindenburg is an unethical short seller. He talks about the irony of basically, um, you know, the fact that Hindenburg are blaming Adani of covering things up and lack of transparency. But Adani's rebuke is, well, nothing is known about Hindenburg either, about their employees. It's very secretive. There's no info on their website. No one knows who their investors are. Um, and he's basically saying they've actively concealed the details of its short positions. They've actively concealed the details of the source of its own funding. And, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a, I mean, this is, this is, you know, Hollywood stuff, um, which is why it's over the front pages of all the kind of financial media um, mm -hmm. around the world. But um, yeah, I mean, maybe we should talk about short selling first. And yeah. And just, just with that point about these um, type of, research companies there was one i remember when i used to cover us equities uh, on a desk and citron research was like the short selling research firm they they are the ones who have been around for like 20 odd years or so they're like the original short sellers yeah. they'd come out with these damning reports and they'd hit a lot of us kind of small caps and you'd see them move violently on the back of these and i remember first few days of my uh, job monitoring these stocks they were like if you see a lemon on the screen <laughs> <laughs> which was like the little icon that went with their posts if that drops down in one of these chat rooms like you need to cover it you need to be all over like, it that microsecond right the stock would just go poof and just hit it like it didn't matter what they said actually well, wow. it's just a track record of the fact that they would move the stock price. And importantly, whether their facts were right or wrong, the stock price moved. So there was profit to be made on the short in the very um, intraday kind of environment that was at least. Right. Um, so tra track, I mean, obviously, track record is key, right? Yeah. So with this, with this Hindenburg research, the, it's got a pretty rough. So the, of these 19 investigations they've reported over the last couple of years most of them are quite small mm. they're going after companies that are tiny mostly companies that have gone public via a SPAC so they're kind of a, a special purpose acquisition company this is where you kind of go public but circumnavigate all the usual kind of regulatory factors anyway I won't go into SPACs now but so most of them would be quite small Fry. What is their famous one was um, Nicola, um, which was um, the uh, electric truck. Oh no, sorry, battery powered lorries. Yeah, so electric trucks, right? And they listed via a SPAC, and um, basically Hindenburg uncovered the fact. So Nicola did this promo video of uh, one of their trucks, you know, driving along. OK, and uh, Hindenburg basically uncovered that they managed to get the truck to move and, and appear like it's driving along <laughs> to show they're further down the road with regards to their, you know, R&D and getting towards a, a viable product. Well, let me get some guy with a rope pulling it along. <laughs> it was just going, it was just rolling down a hill. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like it was a functioning vehicle. It just wasn't. Uh, anyway, uh, that's their big famous one. So that was in 2020. So Nicola's stock is is down 90 percent um, since then. Hmm. Um, anyway, look, there's two, uh, let me just step back. There's two types of activist investor. You know, one I would 
so, so one is an activist investor who's long the stock and then, you know, buys up a, tries to buy a significant portion and get a seat on the board. Now, if you listen to our episodes regularly, you would have heard us talking about Disney and how the activist investor um, Nelson Peltz um, was doing exactly this, buying up Disney shares, right? And then trying to get a seat on the board to then have a say on how the companies run and what the strategy is and to try and turn the company around. This has been in the news this week because um, Bob Iger, who's stepped back at, into the CEO, CEO role at Disney, has basically caved in and said, okay, yep, yeah, Nelson Peltz, you're right. Right, we're going to lay off a few thousand people. We're going to cut costs. You know, our streaming service is going to be about profitability, not about winning subscribers at all costs. And, you know, we're going to set, a, set in place a restructuring plan. Great, right? And so Peltz, the investor, is trying to then profit from turning the company around and getting it onto a trajectory where it can grow profitably, okay? So you could, could describe that as a, well, is it a healthy, I don't know, a healthy activist investor? I mean, maybe obviously the management team might disagree about what the best strategy is for growth, right? Mm. But the activist uh, investor, surely that at the end of the day, their main incentive is to make money and a profit on their position. So they yeah. strip it down, make the money and get out. Isn't that what maybe. they do? Yeah, that's true. Um, but you could say the short selling activist investors, they're like, you know, they're the ones that are looking to profit from the stock dropping. And, you know, in the case of Hindenburg, as I've described, it's about trying to uncover dodgy, dodgy stuff um, and reveal it to the world. You know, like if lid. I was the marketing team of Hindenburg, I'd be saying I'm doing a good thing for society to eradicate fictitious, right. fraudulent companies. Yes, indeed. But this does have quite... Well, when it gets to people like Adani, it has some pretty powerful, mm. you know, ripple effects out across. Too big to fail. <clears throat> well, indeed. Um, so look, short selling. So what, what they do is prior to releasing their report, they then go short um, various financial assets linked to Adani. Right? So they might go short Adani shares. Obviously, Adani has got lots of different companies in this conglomerate, right, which are listed. So these are shares on the stock exchange. There's derivatives links to this stuff. There's corporate bonds linked to these companies. And so going short. So what does that mean? Well, if you want to, if you think the share price of something is going to drop, then you can go short by borrowing those shares off a broker or an investment bank. Um, then you sell the shares that you've just borrowed okay let's say let's say the shares are, are trading at hundred dollars right it's hundred dollars a share let's say you think it's going to go to 50 right so i'm going to borrow these shares and i'm going to sell them at hundred dollars okay if i'm right and the price starts to drop great i'm, I'm in the money right and let's, let's say it hits my target and goes down to fifty dollars right i then buy the stock back at 50 and i give that stock back to the broker that I borrowed it from. So I sold at 50. I bought, sorry, I sold at 100. I bought back at 50. So I make a $50 profit and I give the shares back. Okay. You do have to pay a fee to borrow the shares. So brokers and investment banks, you know, a big revenue stream for them is providing stock for short sellers. So the broker or the investment bank will charge a fee. And that typically these fees range, well, sorry, vary, right? And the range can typically, it's like 0.3% up to 3% per year. So if you borrowed, you know, if you borrowed whatever, um, 100 of these shares that are valued at $100, well, that's $10,000 worth of shares, right? I can just imagine if there's a big bank like JP Morgan and a company so large as Adani Group that we're probably lending to them and then wow. actually we're then <laughs> short selling them in the banking division. But then in the commercial side, it's like, oof, 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's it, that, that's actually a really good point, and the and the lineup of banks that are lenders to these lot. I mean, it's yeah. basically all of them. It's yeah. uh, Barclays, Citigroup, Deutsche Bank, J.P. Morgan. The list goes on. They're all lending. Uh, but then you are right. Um, the other side of the Chinese wall mm. of these banks, yeah, they're lending out stock for short sellers to to kind of try and drive the price down. So yeah, it's it's an interesting one, but. Um, so yeah, you might you might pay between 0.3% and 3%, right? So just think for this trade to work, let's say you're paying 3% a year, for the trade to work, the stock has to drop by more than 3%, and only then are you kind of in the money, right? Um now to to do this, you you have to also know what you know, it's not if it's not anyone, any average on the street that can go short a Dani stock, right? To do this, you basically have to be a financial institution like a hedge fund and you have to post margin on account at the broker firm and if you and typically on short selling the amount of margin you need to post is 150 percent of the value of the shares that you're borrowing at the point that you're borrowing them okay so if you want to borrow ten thousand dollars worth of shares you got to post fifteen thousand dollars cash into the margin account of the broker OK, so look, it's quite it's quite. Yeah, you need a lot of capital. You need to be a financial institution. You need a margin account and you need one of these big brokers or investment banks to allow you to open a margin account and deal through you. And there's this big risk of like what happened with Citroen Research, who I understand doesn't exist anymore because ah. guess what company forced them to close out a big short that ended them? What do you uh, reckon? I'm gonna go company. Just think, a company in the last couple of years that Credit was Swiss. fundamentally a disaster, but shares went to the moon and back. Uh, pro, uh, GameStop. GameStop killed them. Right, really? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, the thing is about going short. It's yeah. considered to be more risky, right? And the theory is because if you buy a stock. Worst case, you lose 100%. Hmm. If the stock goes to zero, right, I've lost 100% of my money. The thing about going short is the stock price can go up. I mean, there's no limit, right? And in theory, it's infinite. Of course, obviously, it's not going to go to infinity. But the point is it can go up by more than 100%. You can lose more than 100% of your money, which is why the margin requirements are 150%. Of, of the value, right? But you could lose more than that. And as the stock is moving, as the stock price is moving, and let's say it does start going up, and so you're losing money now, you're offside on your position, the brokers more, more than, you know, within their rights of, of issuing a margin call, um, demanding that you now post more cash into your margin account to kind of rebalance it, to make up for the loss that you're currently in. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a risky business. For sure, and Citroen obviously found that out. Um, but so, th so this is the play, right? Hindenburg issued this report, uh, and basically they're, they're 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 saying in the report um, that there's dodgy stuff um, going on, and that there's these um, dodgy accounts in in Mauritius, and basically they're yeah opaque entities. To quote the report. Um, in Mauritius, where apparently they're basically accusing the Adani family of manipulating the group's stock price. Um, they're saying that Adani have used a network of obscure offshore shell companies to buy and sell shares in the various Adani businesses, and, and in so doing, pumping up their share prices, um, or they're kind of injecting uh, funds into these businesses temporarily to make them appear like they're more credit worthy. And then on that positive credit worthiness footing, they're then borrowing uh, money from public markets. And then, you know, oops, that money then disappears out of the account. And this is what Hindenburg is saying, right? It's all kind of a house of cards. And, you know, it's not what it appears, right? So, this report gets issued. It's all over the press. Um, 
the share prices of the various companies have dropped super sharply. I mean, we're talking about down 50% um, across, on average, across the group's listed firms, they're down around 50%, which is $114 billion worth of market cap that's been wiped off here. Um, and also on their bond yields. So if creditworthiness decreases, then the risk of lending so this entity obviously in increases, right? And this gets reflected in bond yields. And so when bond yields go up, that means it's basically more expensive for you to borrow because you're less credit worthy. And um, at its extreme at the moment, their Adani's renewables arm, their corporate bonds are now trading with a yield of 19%. Um, so yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty desperate times. Now, what's happened talking about kind of margin calls um because um adani had a margin call mm. because they borrowed money you know using stock as collateral but if the stock prices are dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping well then they're less valuable that's less collateral and so it's dropped so much that they've been requested to post more collateral to cover that now they borrowed a load of money to um actually get, start a, a share buyback program so they borrowed money to buy back shares, which isn't in itself uh, dodgy. And in this environment of zero interest rates, I mean, Apple have been doing that for a decade, borrowing money at super cheap kind of rates and then buying back their own stock. I mean, it, it's not it's not an unusual um, practice. Um, but yeah, um, Barclays basically issued. So they borrowed one point one billion for the share buyback loan. Um, and Barclays issued a margin call for $500 million last week, okay? Or well, sorry, this week, um, because the share prices have dropped. So, but here's where Adani start fighting back. So number one, they issued this 413-page rebuttal against Hindenburg. Second, rather than paying this $500 million margin call, they said, you know what? We're going to pay back the entire $1.1 billion loan. <laughs> We're not in trouble here. This is all false. This is all fake. Mm. We're going to prove it. We're going to pay back that loan right now. And they have. Now, no one knows where this money's come from. Um, so uh, that that action doesn't necessarily prove innocence. Yeah, because there's, then... a, there's a precedent of this in recent times, which was the Abraj group. Well, if, if you are Indian and you're aware of Adani, you'll be aware of the yeah. Abraj group, which was Afrish, Af, Afrif Najib, I think his name was. And he was doing very, it sounds very similar. It was like, you owe us back hundreds of millions. And then he came up with the money temporarily by moving a lot of things around. So yeah, to, to come up with a billion shop, um, what do they call it? Window dressing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't think, well, I see what he's trying. I see the hand he's yeah. trying to play there, but. As I say, doesn't prove his innocence. Um, mm. but look, it, this does set in motion a series of events because what's happened as the share prices have dropped, the MSCI indices have now reduced the weighting of Adani group stocks in their indexes, which basically then forces um, ETF tracker funds to sell Adani stock because mm. they no longer need as much because the weighting's been reduced. So it triggers this snowball, uh, which drives the stock lower and lower and lower, and hence then the margin call and fine, they've gone, right, we're going to pay it. We've issued a rebuttal. They've just hired, like news this morning, they've just hired this new law, New York law firm, uh, Watchtel, Lipton, Rosen and Katz, um, which is a super expensive you know, hardcore New York law firm who specialize in fighting against short sellers. Mm. So Adani has just signed up this 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 law firm and they are going, they're, they're, they're not backing down. Um, and I guess, look, you're, you're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty, right? I know Hindenburg have thrown up all of these sort of accusations, but... Um, so has Adani started to lean on the government yet? Because you said earlier that yeah. you know, he's in his pocket. You know, you don't, these free rides in my private jet don't come for free. Well, Modi's been, he basically hasn't said anything. 
Mm. He's, he's, he's said not been been yeah eerily silent, which I guess maybe speaks volumes. But um, the thing about Modi and broadly the Indian economy, it's got it's got such huge potential. Um, the demographics are awesome. They're, they're going to be a powerhouse economy. What's held them back is their infrastructure, the lack of infrastructure, roads, bridges, railways, power plants. They, It's just been the, the kind of thorn in their side in terms of advancing as an economy. And they, they've been through various kind of phases of trying to go through mega investment rounds in infrastructure, um, and it's not been handled well. The governance side of it hasn't been particularly strong. And there's been a lot of unfinished product um, projects and a lot of banks saddled with toxic debt as a result. And they, they've had false starts and they're miles behind when it, if you compare it to China. OK, mm. over the last couple of, de- let's say, three decades, China have just nailed it in terms of infrastructure build out and india have just it's just been a bit of a disaster so the problem modi has is he's so reliant on these guys like adani to advance this infrastructure um project like adani had committed to 50 billion dollars of spend and investment on indian infrastructure so they need they need people like modi needs the adanis to fund India's future. I mean, it's literally, it's literally like that. So, yeah. So on, a on a government level, then, at what point does Modi get involved? Sees this as a U.S. attack on right Indian sovereignty issues because it's disrupting, like you said, not just the stock price, potentially the citizens of India on a wide scale. India, we know, has been maneuvering geopolitically to align and become quite friendly with the likes of China, which adds another layer of yep. complexity and the, the growing, in some way, friction with the Americans. Do you think it would ever get that far? I, I, th- I think the fact that Modi's not come out defending him, I, I think, tells you everything. Mm-hmm. That, that would be my hunch and my opinion. I, I guess the tragedy... Well, let's just for one second assume he's guilty. The, the, the human tragedy of all of this mm. is that this guy is like the worst criminal you could possibly imagine because what's going to happen now if he is guilty, then international investment into Indian infrastructure, mm. that is going to be set back years and years and years, which then has a very, very direct negative impact on Indian people's lives. I mean, that's that's the real tragedy of these sort of episodes. Now, he might not be guilty, so I don't know. And actually, let's just go there for a second. If yep. he's not guilty, then Hindenburg mm. is the guilty party. And I mean, I, it's crazy. Like, we talk about market manipulation and how that is illegal under SEC rules. And this is exactly, I mean, this is, I'm going to short sell, then I'm going to post a report basically accusing this company of being fraudulent, and then I'm going to profit as the stock collapses. But if you've told a lie, if your investigation and your reporting is false, then then surely you're the guilty party. But there don't seem to be any SEC regulations that kind of police these short sellers. And Hmm. so I don't know. We'll see. The battle goes on. The lawyers have been instructed. And um, yeah, the, the 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 gloves are on. I think ding, ding, round yeah. one. Here we go. I think we've said this before in a previous episode. There's always one winner here in these situations. That's the lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it doesn't matter what side, what happens. Yes. They just print the money. Indeed. But uh, perhaps you and I went into the wrong profession. Um, it's not too late. <laughs> Well, look, hopefully that episode was useful, uh, covered a couple of different concepts there, uh, activist short selling being one of the main ones, uh, aside from the actual topic in itself. So yeah, we'll wrap it up there. Um, don't forget to share the the pod with a friend if you think that they could benefit from it. Um, we'd love to have new people into the community. 
Uh, had some really great messages uh, as well since we've come back on since the new year began. So thanks everyone for listening. And Piers, thank you again and then catch you next week. Yep. Have a good weekend.